Good morning, brethren. Still morning. Good morning. Well, brethren, it is an absolute miracle that I'm sitting here this morning because as of the time that I went to sleep last night, I didn't think that I would be physically capable of preaching this morning. And the way things are moving forward, I expect to be fully healed by the time I finish preaching this message. I will give you a full testimony on another occasion. But I would appreciate your prayers because I'm still, um, I'm still a little, I'm not, not myself yet. Ten minutes ago, I'm, when I prepared this introduction, I was going to say I'm still a little weak. Well, I don't know how weak I am. <laughs> I'm just getting healed by the second. Okay, I'm coming around by the second. But I would appreciate your prayers. There's no doubt in my mind at this point that I will be able to preach this full message, which I didn't know if I could do even that when I woke up this morning. And so glory to God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth, that He has the power to heal. He is the Spirit of truth, that all healing is in His name and in His life and in His blood. But you have to, if you're desiring that healing, you can only get it when you follow His channel. You have to go through channels, okay? In this world, if you want the healing of this world, you have to go to a doctor, you have to get, make an appointment, you have to wait to be seen. There are channels, there's a, an order that you have to follow uh, to qualify for God's supernatural healing. You can't just hold up the book and say, I answered an altar call and I expect to be healed. Although sometimes he will honor such a statement, but he's not obligated to do so. So brethren, I have a very interesting message for you today. It's Colossians chapter 2. And when I first told you a couple of meetings ago, maybe two meetings ago, that we were going to start spending some time in the New Testament, I thought that, well, you know, we, we reached our, well, and that still may be true, we reached our climax. Well, that tremendous push for, for new revelations arrived at the climactic, climactic point, excuse me, of the understanding that there is a second born again experience. Why such a, pr a press and a push on the revelation? Because it's coming, and, and God has to tell his prophets before it actually happens. We, you have to expect it for it to happen to you. Or maybe it could happen to you anyway, but it's in, it's in God's right order that we should know about it before it happens to us. So, and then I said, well, now we're going to spend some time in the New Testament. Um, and just, uh, you know, just bringing forth the, the, the understanding by the power, by the, by the wisdom of Kabbalah, not the power, by the wisdom of Kabbalah. And let's just reveal it through the New Testament for the people who, who don't have the wherewithal or the, or the desire to go through Kabbalah. <clears throat> but when I prepared chapter two, I said this is just really amazing because the truth of the matter is that you really cannot find the message that I preach in the Old Testament. I mean, I, I, I make particular points. I can show you this in the Old Testament. I can show you that. Mostly, I have to show it to you through Kabbalah, uh, through the esoteric doctrine. But to actually see the message that I preach, Christ in you has to join with the Lord Jesus Christ, has to be reconnected to ancient Adam, uh, and, and the resurrection, the resurrection of our nephesh, by pulling our nephesh soul out of our bones, okay, to have your soul, your nephesh, your five grades of soul, to have the nephesh grade of soul uh, saved, it has to be separated from your body because the body is not going to be saved. This physical body that gets sick and is capable of death is not going to get saved, it's going to be dissolved. That's what Peter is talking about. Uh, with the elements falling in great fire and all that. It's a spiritual fire that's going to dissolve this body, okay, which, is, uh, pr which is problematic, except that it's the only way that our soul can express itself in this uh, dimension at this time. So, um, I completely lost my train of thought, but I know that I, what I was trying to tell you I don't know how, how I got into talking about the soul when I was trying to tell you. Oh yes, I was describing the message to you, yes. The separation of the nephesh soul, which is your personality, from your body, which is the salvation of your nephesh and grade of soul. 
uh, the, the, this whole message is intact in Colossians chapter 2. Paul, Paul set it forth in Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> but you have to have the revelation in your heart in order to see it in Colossians chapter 2 because it's abbreviated. It's, uh, and, and what did we read about in Colossians chapter 1? Paul is talking about the mystery. The mystery that's been hidden from all the generations of all the ages prior to this age and this generation. The mystery has been hidden. The mystery of how God is going to rescue humanity, how he's going to rescue Adam, how he's going to rescue his own breath, which is the Shekinah in captivity, how he's going to overthrow or undo the accident that happened when Adam in the garden married the snake instead of Elohim. It's a great mystery. And that mystery today is revealed to those who are chosen to hear it. And it's also being prepared for the Gentiles to hear it also. Okay. And that message, of course not in the detail that I've been preaching it, but it's, it's, it is the message. It is there in, in Colossians chapter 2. If you can see it, if you can, if you can see it behind the, the cherubim with flaming swords, because you, I, I have seen it, and that is all set forth in the alternate translation. The average person can't see it. But here is the message. If anyone should ever say to you, where is that in the scripture? Here it is. And if you can't understand it from me, perhaps you can believe the alternate translation, which also takes a leap of faith, because it is an alternate translation. But perhaps you can believe the alternate translation, and someday we'll have it in a book with all of the notes so you can see how I worked it up and how I came to this conclusion. Uh, so I see that the Lord putting us in the New Testament is more than just, well, let's just reveal the message through the New Testament, you know, now that we've, we, we've climaxed. Now, when I say we've climaxed, I don't mean that that's the end of all revelation because the revelation of the Word of God is infinite, but we have we have climaxed at the point that God has assigned us to attain to today. It may change tomorrow, or it may be, it may be the message for this age, or, or it may be for, for now. So, I can't believe that I'm preaching and I'm breathing. I was almost going to tell you, well, I'm, I can't get much volume up, so I hope that you can hear me. <laughs> Glory to God, I am so excited at this healing that is take, still taking, it's, it's culminating in me right now. Okay, brethren, I have, at the beginning of your notes, I have, uh, I have reproduced the, um, actually Susan did it for me, and she, she put these notes together for me, um, at least the framework of it, so that I can work in it. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I've asked her to reproduce the alternate translation of Colossians chapter 1, primarily because when I went into that alternate translation to annotate it, and I saw the necessity for a particular footnote, I recognized that I had not made that point during the message. So that's really the main reason why we have Colossians chapter 1 reproduced here with all the annotations. You can see the references. But the footnote that I'm referring to is on page 2, and it's footnote number 4, which is um, which is a footnote to, if anyone finds it, hey, Eight, 18, verse 18. Last, last word. Ah, last word, verse 18. Okay. Okay. And this is really interesting, brethren, it is just so interesting how the mind of Christ in me functions. I, I have so many questions about it. I get... I get words of knowledge that it's really, at least maybe in my, in my ignorance, they're not important. They're just really interesting. We have, I have this whole list in my mind, I don't think it's a, it, that the list actually exists, of all the books that we're supposed to be creating. And one of the books that got lost in the, in the, in the, in the insanity, of, what do we have, 40 books? We've published 40 yes. books, right? yeah. that's insane that we published 40 <laughs> books already. In the, in the insanity of getting these 40 books on the market, 
the one of the books that got lost in the in the crush was the revised edition, the second edition of Nova, the Nova Chronicles, which is really it's really a very important book. The problem was at the very towards the end of the book, I I just knew that I didn't have the revelation right, and really that's why I pushed it to the back. I knew I didn't have the revelation right, and about a week ago. Uh, right now, my priority is I have to finish the Gathering Demoniac, and then I was going to do this, and then I was going to do that, and then I was going to do that. And about a week ago, Noah, the Noah Chronicles just rose in my consciousness, just rose in my consciousness. And I said, wow, I really think I have to finish that book, and, and uh, if I, um, most likely, if I check it out now, I, I should be able to to get the correct. I should be able to correct the revelation that which, which was disturbing me that I didn't think I had it right. Mm. And then with everything that the Lord's taught us, I should be able to do it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that right after I finish the Gathering Demoniac. And here I am writing a footnote referring everybody to the Noah Chronicles. <laughs> <laughs> so so that that word of knowledge rose in my spirit that what the Lord is teaching in the Noah Chronicles is coming into play. I don't know any other words to express it. It's coming into play in the spiritual plane. And here it is, uh, a cross-reference in Colossians chapter 1. So, brethren, it is so exciting. The spiritual life is so exciting. I pray that you should all, if you want it, you should all have the experience that I have. It's the most exciting thing that ever happened to me in my life. I wouldn't give it up for anything in this world. And I don't think that I've seen anything yet. I have not seen anything yet. I want to tell you, I was really sick yesterday. <laughs> okay, let's go. So this is footnote number four. I'll read the sentence. Uh, Primordial Adam <coughs> The one who existed from the beginning, and I'm trying to call him ancient Adam, but the reason I made it primordial Adam here, you may recall, is that the word primordial actually came up in one of the ultimate translations. So I'm staying with primordial for this translation. Maybe I'll start with verse, meeting with verse 15. Primordial Adam, who was the image of the invisible God of the whole creation. Because the whole Adam in heaven and in earth, invisible and visible, was created by him, including thrones or civil powers or primordial entities. You see the word primordial that came up. It's an alternate translation of something in verse 16. Or authorities. The whole Adam was created by him and for him. And he came before the whole Adam, and the whole Adam is sustained by him. And primordial Adam, the one who existed from the beginning, holds the highest rank of the whole church, which rank is the head of the body of the firstborn Adam that died. Yeah, the issue is the body of the firstborn Adam that died. The body of Christ, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is spiritual. It's the body of Christ, although maybe I haven't seen it correctly. I always saw the body of Christ as the group of believers, of the, so the souls of the believers, but I think I've been seeing it incorrectly. The body of Christ is just that, the corporeal, material, physical body of the invisible Christ. And we've, we've had a lot of talk, we've discussed a lot recently about the ransom, how Jesus is in potential, and how all of the soul sparks of the second Adam are in potential. They need a body to incarnate in, in this world, and that's what the ransom is all about. These soul sparks, you know, are, are in the form of, of the seed that Jesus sows. We get his seed. Okay. We get his seed, which has the potential to become uh, an actual uh, child, spiritual child, which is eternal. And that spiritual child is joined permanently to ancient Adam. He becomes immortal, and we receive eternal life. So to say that Jesus offers us eternal life, 
So you have to understand the process. The church doesn't understand the process, so they think it's after you die, because they see people dying. So they think eternal, eternal life is after death, but that's not true. Eternal life is in the flesh, and they shall be saved in childbearing. Okay? When you bear that spiritual child, that qualifies you to marry ancient Adam. Okay? Okay? That raises that spiritual child okay, out of what we're told in Colossians chapter 2. That spiritual child is buried under our dead earth, brethren. This body is dead. And the nephesh soul in our marrow is dead. Okay. We have life because the Lord Jesus has given us his spirit. And those of us here have a neshema, intellectual, spiritual soul, okay, the third grade of soul. Okay. But our soul is dead. Paul clearly says your soul is dead because of your transgressions. Our soul is dead because of sin, and the body is dead. There's two different, basically two different words that mean dead in, in the Greek. Necros means dead, like dead, dead. No, no, cho no chance of resurrection. Dead. Thanatos is the death, pretty much the death of the body because the soul leaves the body. We, the human, which really actually are the nephesh grade of soul, we experience death, okay? When, um, when the spirit, did I say the soul, uh, that was incorrect, we experience death, our personality experiences death with the body when our spirit goes back to the Father who gave it. Our soul, our nephesh soul, our personality, and our body are intricately enmeshed and joined inseparably together. It is a miracle that we're told in the book of Hebrews that the sword of the spirit is capable. The word of God is capable of separating this soul from the marrow of this body. When it happens, it's a miracle. So if there's a carcass left after you die, that means that your soul and your body are under the ground and your spirit went back to the Father who gave it. Your soul is dead, brethren. My soul is dead. The soul that's attached to this body is dead. Necros. Okay, but the, but we're alive because of the spirit. So, what was I trying to tell you? <laughs> what was I trying to tell you? <clears throat> I think that's what, that was my point. That that our soul is is dead, and it's dead. And the only way. The process of resurrection of the nephesh soul is to separate it from the body. That's the only way to save your soul, which is your personality, is to separate from the marrow of the bones. So I was telling you that Christ in us is buried under the earth of this body and this dead soul. The scripture tells us in Colossians 2, it calls it a baptism of death. In other words, I was teaching years ago in message number 18 that the female seed was buried in the earth. That was the start of the creation, or one of the aspects of the It wasn't the beginning, but it was a part of the beginning of the creation that the female seed was buried in the earth. And, and message 18, a place teeming with life, describes the experience of that seed with how, how she was horrified and being buried under the earth. So, I think I better calm down. I can't be getting that animated. Please pray for me, brother. I have to be calmer than I am. I thought I was fully healed, but I'm not. Just getting there. So, so Colossians chapter 2 tells us that Christ was buried in baptism. He was baptized when he was entered into us. So when Christ is raised from the dead, when Christ is raised up out of the waters, out of the, Christ was buried in a baptism of earth, although it doesn't say that, that's the implication. When he's joined to ancient Adam and raised up out of this earthen grave, when he's married to our nephesh soul, we rise up with him. We are, we are co-heirs to that resurrection. Okay, so 
until I bit a cotton candy, and that'd be so animated. So that's what I was trying to tell you, I think. So we're talking about the first Adam, the, the body of the, fir of the firstborn Adam that died. So I was telling you that the body of Christ, I always thought it was a body of souls, but it's not. That phrase, the body of Christ, is actually, actually talking about the physical people who provide the corporeal body for Christ so that he can express himself in the earth. Now, my footnote to that statement is talking about the death of the firstborn. Footnote number four, Jesus Christ is a member of the first Adam who died. Jesus Christ was a mortal man. He was born of a man and a woman, Joseph, who inherited the seed from David, was responsible for the generation of the physical body of the man Jesus of Nazareth. Any deity that was present was within him. It was a, it was a glorious soul. It was a living soul that was born with him. But his body was dead. Any body, in the, any physical body in this form is dead. Because this body is, listen brethren, the, the essential spirit the creation is an essential spirit that is clothing itself in, in clouds or in shadiness so that it can be seen. And there are multiple dimensions. Each dimension or each world that this, and this spirit is a many membered spirit. Each world that it enters into, it takes on a body that is appropriate for that world. Jesus has a body today that's appropriate for the world that he's in. And if he goes to another world, he takes a body that's appropriate for that world. See? This world is hell. And the, 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 the attribute of this world is death. So the body that clothes the essential spirit in this world is dead. Everything here is dead. This wood is dead. Everything's dead, or at least in a form of death. Immovable. Death means immovable. Death means bound. Even the plants that you say, well, sure, they're alive. Well, they're alive, but they're dead because they can't leave the ground. The, that which is alive is free. That which is from above, Paul says, is free. You're free to go anywhere and do anything that the Spirit moves on you to do. Okay. I have to slow down, brother. So Jesus Christ is a mortal man, a member of the first Adam who died. He is a mortal man whose resurrection from the dead faithfully witnessed to the truth of God's promise to Abraham that his descendants would inherit the land of Canaan, or Canaan, and that is Genesis 24, 7. The Hebrew word translated, did you understand what I just said? Let me read it again. Jesus is a member of the first Adam who died. He is a mortal man whose resurrection from the dead faithfully witnessed to the truth of God's promise to Abraham, that his descendants would inherit the land of Canaan. That's the faithful witness. Jesus was witnessing to, I've always thought Jesus was witnessing to God's existence. Well, that's true, he was witnessing to God's existence, but even more than that, he was witnessing to the fulfillment of Jehovah's promise to Abraham and his descendant would inherit the land. So who is, is, is uh, Abraham's descendant? Abraham's descendant is Christ. Christ in you is the heir, H-E-I-R. And we are co-heirs with him. What are we co-heirs to? To the land of Israel in, in the Middle East? No. Christ is, an heir, is inheriting uh, the, 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 the earth, the spiritual earth, that formed this dead body. But this dead earth can, this earth can be formed into a living body also. He inherited the earth. Isn't that what the scripture says? And the meek shall inherit the earth. 
We're inheriting the earth. Well, everybody thinks we're inheriting the planet. We are inheriting the planet. But we need a body that will function on this planet, made out of the same elements as the planet is. The inheritance is, the, is a body for an invisible spirit, an invisible consciousness. The inheritance is a body that will let it function in this world without dying. That's the inheritance, the body, the land. So, the Hebrew word translated Canaan actually means to humiliate. And this is the teaching in the book, the Noah Chronicles. The Hebrew word translated Canaan actually means to humiliate, as laid out in the Noah Chronicles. And Susan, I forgot to tell you, if you could just please get the date of that publication and get it in there, I'd appreciate it. Ham was a, and this is a great mystery, Ham did not look like we did. Ham, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they were not homo sapien. They were not homo sapien, brethren. They were a higher life form that was made to be joined to homo sapien, humanity. They were in a spiritual form that was designed to be the inner man of humanity. Actually, I actually was thinking um, yesterday as, as I prepared this message that I, I don't know what kind of what kind of bodies Noah might have had before the flood, but um, I, I sort of had this revelation in pieces. Okay, that at the time of the flood, he actually came. They actually came out of their bodies. I knew that they ascended above the flood. I told you that. They ascended above the flood into another dimension somehow. And when the flood waters receded, they descended. But as of now, I'm thinking that they actually came, that they, the, whatever bodies they had must have been of the material that was destroyed on the other side of the flood. So their salvation took a form of actually leaving their bodies. They went back into potential. Noah, Shem, and... and and Japheth went back into potential somehow, although they had some kind of a body because they had the ark. They had something that kept them alive. And then, they, and then when they came to descend, when, when the time came to descend back down into the earth, their job was to save humanity. Now somehow, oh, Lord, please help me to explain this. Listen, I got all carried away with myself. Okay. Let me, uh, let me say it this way. Shem, Him, and Japheth were in the same state as Christ is today. Noah was in the same role that Jesus is in today. Only Noah was not glorified. And what role is Jesus in today? Jesus mediates between humanity and ancient Adam who has eternal life. Jesus in and of himself does not have eternal life. He has eternal life because he's permanently joined to ancient Adam. Okay? Noah was in the same role as mediator between humanity and Jehovah, the one that has eternal life. And Shem, Ham, and Japheth were his seeds, like Christ is the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only it could not have been exactly the same, because it was happening on a higher plane of consciousness. So I don't have any more information than this, other than that. It, had, it, could, it was not exactly like it is now, and that it had to be uh, on a higher plane of consciousness that I don't understand yet. But Shem, Him, and Japheth were in the function of the Christ seed of the Lord Jesus Christ that's being joined to humans, which is the beginning of the process that develops a female, a spiritual child, not a female, but a spiritual child in the individual, which makes the individual eligible to marry, for marriage to ancient Adam, which is, eternal, which is the resurrection of the dead for both the, the spiritual child that we give birth and the soul that that spiritual child 
is not only attached to, but a part of. I have a whole interesting teaching in one of my books. I think it's the book about marriage. I have this whole interesting teaching on when a man and a woman marry and they produce a child, the, the soul the soul of the two parents is in that is blended immovably in that child. The soul you can't do, you can't dissolve that marriage. And maybe a court of law can dissolve the marriage, and you can physically separate. But spiritually, you are bound forever so long as that child lives. Or one of the parties to the marriage dies, because your soul. The soul can be in more than one place at a time, and your soul is in yourself, it's in your wife, and it's in your child. So if you separate from your child, from, from your wife, you know, and you don't like her anymore, and you divorce her, your souls will be bound forever, so long as that child lives. That's why Jesus said, if you marry again, you're an adulteress, or an adulterer. Because you're married to that woman through the existence of your child. You can understand what I'm saying. Mm. So, so Noah was in the same role that Jesus is in, except he wasn't glorified. He was purified enough and what was purified enough to what, through the process at that time to have a relationship with Jehovah. And he sent forth his seeds, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I don't know how formed they were. I don't know if they were as subtle, subtle as the seed of Christ that we receive, or whether it was another, they were in another form, I don't know. Neither do I know what form humanity was in. And also, here is a great mystery, because I know I know what I'm telling you is the truth. And I'm getting this revelation that's in the, uh, the Noah Chronicles even deeper as I sit here talking to you. I know that what I just told you is the truth. So if that's the truth, we have a problem. Does anybody know what the problem is? I'll, I'll tell you, this is what I told you. Noah is in the same, was in the same world that Jesus was in, although he wasn't glorified and he wasn't perfect. He was purified enough to his relationship with Elohim, to a relationship with Jehovah. On the one end, he was connected above, and then he had three seeds, sent Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that he sent forth to, to have the same function that the seed of Christ is having with the body of Christ today, which is that that seed should produce a child in us that is eligible to marry Jehovah, which, which jumps over the mediator. Can you understand that? Jesus connects us to, Jesus connects us to ancient Adam. When that man-child is born in us, ancient Adam marries the man-child, and we don't need the mediator anymore. Do you understand that? I'll say it again. Jesus, At this end, he's connected to ancient Adam. At the bottom, he's connected to us. So we're connected to ancient Adam. We have access to ancient Adam through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Through our relationship with Jesus Christ, our, we hope to one day produce a spiritual child. And that spiritual child is called the Lamb of God. And the Lamb of God is the bride of ancient Adam. So when ancient Adam marries the Lamb of God, which is growing out of us, we don't need this anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that spiritual child that we birth is, is uh, a, a mixture isn't even the right word. Is it? Is the product that spiritual child is the product of our very own soul, our nefesh soul? Why? Because that man child is attached to us, to our material self. That man child is growing out of our nefesh 
greater soul. And it's also the soul, which is the seed of Jesus, the soul of the glorified Jesus, the overcoming soul of Jesus of Nazareth is an element in it, and our soul become inextricably joined. They cannot be separated. So when Christ in us marries the ancient Adam, when ancient Adam marries the, not Christ's, but the lamb, the man-child in us, we automatically go with it. And therefore are joined to ancient Adam directly through the child that we produce, which is a which is a, a, a child, it's a spirit, and it's a child that has a spirit and a soul, and the soul is a combination of our fallen soul and the soul of Christ, the, the overcoming soul of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to go with it. We can't be separated from it. And forever we will be with the Lord, because our soul is now married to ancient Adam through the child that we produce that we cannot be separated from. You can hear what I just said. So, so what's what's the problem? Does anybody see the problem? This is what I'm telling you. That Noah was in the same role as, as Jesus, only he wasn't glorified. And Shem, Ham, and Japheth were the seeds that are like the seed of Christ. That's of Christ. Okay. So what's the problem? And their job was to. Uh, let, let me tell you this too. Their job was to find a human that they can dwell with. Just like the seeds of the a seed of Jesus Christ found me. I became his Canaan. He found a, a, a member of the human race. And the destiny of the human race, which is what is who was the human race? The human race is basically that female seed that came from the Shekinah attached to the earth human race is that female seed that's attached to the earth. And we have an emptiness in us that needs to be filled. There's a, there's a big hole in us that needs to be filled. Something's lacking in us. We need to produce that child to be whole, you see. And in order to produce that child, we have to have a relationship with a spiritual male. So that seed that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, or that chromosome that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, is male to me, a human. And it gets inside of me and it works inside of me. It works towards producing that man-child. So what's, what's wrong with this picture? Noah is in Jesus' role, the same role, although not the same. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the seeds that Jesus Christ is sowing into humanity. And this is right after the flood. What's the problem with what I'm saying? What's wrong with the picture? What, what is it about the picture that we need an explanation for? Okay, I'll tell you. The scripture says everything in the earth was destroyed by the flood. Where is humanity coming from? I thought everything in the earth was destroyed by the flood. I thought everything in the earth was destroyed by the flood. And we also have ancient literature, non-scriptural ancient literature, that shows that the, the community of Sumaria, a, a full, a, a flourishing community, existed right after the flood. How did this happen? How did this happen? <laughs> well, the answer that I think the Lord is reminding me of, because it, it, the, the thought rose in my mind as a question that I didn't know the answer to, but now what's coming to me is something that I have previously taught you. That, that flood that occurred, it occurred on a higher spiritual plane. It didn't occur on this spiritual plane. It occurred on a higher spirit, spiritual plane, and it, it could have been likened to being in a boat that sprung a leak, and the water was just filling up the boat so that the boat sunk. The flood was on a spiritual plane that was higher than this, but everything that was heavier than that, than that water fell down into a lower world this world. Huh? It fell down into this world. So when it says everything in the earth was destroyed, it was destroyed in, in that present form, which was a higher form than this world we don't know what it looked like. 
and it, it was moved to a lower world, this world. So humanity was here, Sumaria was here, okay? We had the, the demigods, which were Gilgamesh and his like, and his ilk. And humanity was here too, they, they changed form. I, and some of the esoteric literature that I read, they say they just woke up one morning and all, uh, I think it was in, um, I'm, I'm not sure which book it was that I read, either in the book of Joshua or the book of Joy. It wasn't the book of, I'm reading the book of Joints now. Either the book of Jasher or the book of, it wasn't in the book of Joints, maybe in the book of Enoch or in the book of Jasher, one of them. They looked uh, and all of the, everyone was covered with clay. All of the beings that existed in the world before the flood, they were covered with clay. So they had spiritual bodies and now they're all covered with clay. Did it happen overnight? I don't know. I don't know. It might have happened overnight, I don't know. So we don't know how we don't know how long it took to happen. But we know that the world before the flood was destroyed. And there were elements of that world that survived by falling down into a lower world. And Noah became the connection to the old world. Because the old in the old world, Jehovah was accessible. Jehovah was accessible without a mediator like Jesus Christ in the old world. So Noah was the connection to Jehovah. From he was he was he was a, a, a carryover from the old world, and he sent forth his seeds that that we don't know what they look like, but they were named. I don't when I got I got a seed and you got a seed. Uh, actually, what it comes down to, brethren, if you can hear this, is those of us that have the seed of Christ, we are comparable to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We are the, I am right here this morning. I am either Shem, Him, or Japheth, okay, seeking to plant the seed in me and you. See? So Shem, Him, and Japheth were, were likened in the, to a role that I am in. They were already teachers. They already had a form. They had their own form, I think. <laughs> and uh, they were teachers of the Word of God, and they were going out to save humans. They were going out to save humans by giving them the seed that would produce the man-child in them. What were they saving them from? They were saving them from the snake. They were saving them from the reptilian, because the reason humanity was in this condition, that they were a human vessel without a husband and without a child, okay, is because Adam married the snake instead of Elohim. So Adam betrayed, uh, be, betrayed, uh, actually betrayed the earth. The earth, uh, we're, the, we're the victim. Now once we, we sin, we're responsible for our sins, but those of us that are just clay, that are just flesh, we're victims of the highest spiritual world that turned evil. And that's why God is trying to save us. Now we're responsible for our own sins, but the truth is that we were overcome by a higher species. Of intelligence. See? So the female seed that was attached to the clay, she was supposed to marry Elohim and become a god, and we were supposed to be inherit that godhood, so to speak, with her. But instead of marrying Elohim, she married the snake. And we came and the clay was formed into this present form. And what are we? We are the garment for the reptilian. The female seed, the Shakita, in captivity. <laughs> married the snake and produced a visible creation that is the garment for the reptilian. We are Leviathan. We are he. We are the clay that is, is the garment for the reptilian. You're looking for the reptilians out there? They're here. Your mind is the reptilian mind. The carnal mind is the reptilian mind. So, left to our own devices, if Shem, Ham, and Japheth were not going out to save humanity, if Jesus Christ is not going forth today to save humanity by giving them his spiritual child, 
the destiny of humanity, which is already the garment of the reptilian, is to be approached by the equip the par not the equivalent, but the parallel entity to a Reiki and Peen. Remember I told you a Reiki and Peen or Adam Kimon, if that, that helps you, ancient Adam, if that helps you. Let's not parse the, the words when we're trying to understand this difficult concept. Ancient Adam is to marry the man-child in us. Who is, what entity is in a parallel existence to ancient Adam? Who is in a parallel degree of authority to ancient Adam? Not, not, not equal to him, but in a parallel illegal dimension. Anyway. Oh, what's her name? What's her Sophie. name? Sophia. Sophia is going to come and marry the, 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 okay, let me say it another way. If Jesus, if we're not saved, if, if the man-child of Jesus Christ is not formed in us, okay, at some point in time, if it hasn't probably started already, the reptilian within is going to start producing the reptilian child, the ancient Egypt called him Horus. He is formed today, his name is Lucifer today. There are people involved in the ancient mysteries that want this child born. The Freemasons for one, they want Lucifer born. What they call him, Hiram Abuf, being reborn in the, in the Masons. They want that spiritual child because there's power in that birth. Okay, so the, the reptilian in the world today is going to stir up some of the people that, that uh, are his clothing, that want his power, that they'll study the mystery religions, and they will produce that spiritual child, which will make them eligible for marriage to Sophia. So when these people, when they start studying the mysteries without Jesus Christ, listen, you have to get your wisdom from somewhere. Man, man, Humanity has nothing. So you start studying the mysteries, okay? You have to have a teacher on a high level. So Sophia comes as a counselor. She comes by her spirit. She gives them the revelation. They, they, they start to have a Horus or Lucifer formed in them. And when Lucifer is fully formed, Sophia marries him. And that is eternal life for Sophia. Now, I don't believe the Lord's going to allow that to happen. But that's the plan. So, if God leaves us alone, if Jehovah leaves humanity alone, okay, humanity will be formed in the permanent, eternal image of the reptilian through a marriage to Sophia. So, on the other side, on, on this side of the flood, right after the flood, Noah, Jehovah raised up Noah as a mediator and sent forth Shem, Ham, and Japheth with the ability to impart the seed of Jehovah to humanity to save them from this ultimate fate of humanity. Humanity, the riderless horse. Ignorant humanity that doesn't understand and thinks that they don't need God. It's getting very close to the time and it's already happening. That the man child, that the child of Sophia is being formed in humans, and these people become evil, See? start desiring blood and sacrifice and, and things like that. That's what's happening today. The same thing that happened on the other side of the flood. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, and people think, well, it's the homosexuality, it's this, it's that. All of those things were just symptoms. The issue, the essential, foundational issue, is this. Ancient Adam, okay, he decided to, he is, I'm sorry, he is the creation of God. He is the, responsible for bringing forth the creation of God. He is the, he is the essential one that is bringing forth the creation of God. He sowed a female seed through, a part, through, through one of his se separate so the female seed, with earth attached to it, 
and that Earth cannot survive without being joined internally to the eternal one. Mm -hmm. And there was an accident. And humanity, the Earth that's attached to the female seed, was separated from the male seed. And we're out here on our own. And if Jehovah doesn't get his seed to us and bring forth a man-child in, in each and every human, if it doesn't happen, they are destined ultimately either to die or to produce the child of the reptilian, okay? That is the fruit of the adultery of the woman with the snake. That reptilian which is in us, we're born with a garment of the reptilian, is doing everything it can to produce the child of the reptilian inside of us so that we are eligible to marry Sophia, so what? so that the reptilian inside of us can enter into eternal life. That's why he encourages us to sin. We know, we know him or her is Satan. That's why she encourages us to sin. All of these years I've been saying, well, Satan encourages us to sin, gives us wrong motives and, and influences us to sin because when we sin, it releases energy and she gap, gap, gobbles up the energy. But it's much more than that, brethren. She wants us to sin so that God rejects us. So that we can receive her evil seed and produce the evil child that Sophia will marry and give this reptile, the rep reptile inside of us eternal life. Because when we die, Satan and Leviathan inside of us die also. Just like when we, if Christ is in us and the body dies, Christ dies. Satan and Leviathan, the individual, Satan and Leviathan and Christ, they all die if the body dies without being, without coming to fulfillment. So just like Christ in me is crying out to Jesus to, to fulfill him so that he doesn't have to die when my body dies, so is Satan and Leviathan crying out to Sophia, fulfill us so that we can live, so that we can keep this body alive as the garment of the reptilian and not die. So humanity, humanity, the female, will either be saved or damned forever in childbearing. Depending on the child that we bring forth. That's the reality of our condition that God is trying to save us from. Because he created us. He's responsible for us. It was an accident. The woman married the wrong guy. We read about it in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5. She thought, according to chapter 5 of the Song of Solomon, she thought it was Elohim. She opened the door and it was the wrong guy. I don't think the female seed was e evil. She was the daughter of the Shekinah. She wasn't evil. Anybody have a question on that exhortation? Okay, so, so back to this footnote, okay, is that Jesus Christ is a member of the first Adam who died, is a mortal man whose resurrection from the dead faithfully witnessed to the truth of God's promise to Abraham, and his descendants would inherit the land of Canaan. The Hebrew word translated Canaan actually means to humiliate. As laid out in the Noah Chronicles, Ham was a being of a higher spiritual order than Homo sapien, who was designed to exist coincidentally with and as the outer garment of a spiritual inner man. Homo sapien was humiliated. Brethren, we are humiliated from the day that we're born. That infant, there is no way that infant can survive without an adult to take care of it. We are a humiliated species. Homo sapien was humiliated by the first Adam who died in the previous age when he married the snake and filled them, filled who? Filled humanity with Cain rather than with Abel, Cain the fruit of his adultery. The first Adam who died in the previous age when he married the snake 
and fill them with Cain, the fruit of his adultery. We are, we are clay, and we do have an inner man, and he is reptilian. We have it, there is an inner man inside of us right now, and he is reptilian. And he is open to, if we allow it, okay, he's open to receive the seed of Sophia, which would begin a, this, a, a parallel process to everything I've been teaching you about the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the end of that would be marriage of that, of that reptilian child to Sophia, and that the human would be a co-heir to eternal life in the reptilian world where the flesh is abused. Ham, a spiritual being, rescued one of these humiliated humans by becoming its inner man. Maybe that's not even true. You know. Maybe, you know, maybe Shem, Ham, and Japheth were like I am now. Or whatever any of you have seen. I'm talking about myself because I know I have seen. So when Ham, when it says that Ham returned, well, I can't re I can't re preach the whole Noah Chronicles, so I, I, I'm going too deep. I'll do that when I get to the Noah Chronicles. Let's just leave it at that. Ham was a spiritual being rescued. Uh, Ham, a spiritual being rescued, one of these humiliated humans by becoming its inner man. So we don't know whether Ham was a seed that actually became the inner man of this human, or this human, this Canaan that was rescued, was a disciple like one of you. Let's say one of you were rescued because you received a seed from me. I don't know which is true at this point. Just like the glorified Jesus Christ is becoming the new inner man of the body of Christ, the church, today. Ham also had a son named Canaan. So, I told you all this to try to explain verse 18 to you in a better way. The body of the firstborn Adam that died, because everybody thinks, because the, the, the King James just says, the body of the firstborn that died. Right? So everybody thinks that that was Jesus of Nazareth, because they think that Jesus was the first one, the first begotten of the dead. And I think we even, we even translated that differently. I have, to, I have to read my own alternate translation to get this into my spirit because I can't recall at the moment how I translated it. Mm -hmm. But I know that it was that what the King James says is not correct, that Jesus is the first begotten of the dead. There was another translation from that in Colossians chapter 1. So when we read it out, dead, the church is, to, is always talking about the physical Jesus of Nazareth. And that's not who, who the Lord is talking about. The, the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth was just a, a sack that died. The whole message, the whole exciting message about salvation and eternal life, it, it's not about the body. It's about the soul. It's not about the body. So death. If you automatically think of death of the body when you hear about death, you're thinking in a carnal way. It, the, the default foot should be the death of the soul. Okay, so when we read, when, when the scripture uses the word necros, that means dead, never to rise again. Okay, that's the body. Dead thanatos means the soul died to its present existence. It left the body and went someplace else while the body deteriorated. Thanatos, did I just say that again, so again? Listen, if there's a higher soul in the body when it dies, the soul is saved. If there's no higher soul in the body, there's nothing to be, the spirit is saved. The spirit is always saved. The spirit goes back to the Father who gave it. If the body has a neshema, the neshema hopefully is saved, or actually I can't even say that. I'm sorry, just scratch the last few things I just said. When the body dies, the spirit returns to the Father who gave it. If there is a neshema in that body, that neshema is Christ. 
And if it's not mature enough to be extracted from the body because it's attached to the Lord Jesus, then it dies with the body. The nephesh soul is in the marrow, okay? The only way your personality can be saved is to have it extracted from the marrow, which is like the final process of the process of salvation, which means that all of the Christians that have lived so far, brethren, their personalities have not been saved. Their spirit was saved. So it's okay to say they were saved, their spirit was saved, but their soul was not saved. That's a word that's going to traumatize the church. I do not believe that the, the, this, the nephesh soul that's in the marrow of your bones has eternal life. How can, how can we say that it has eternal life? How can the church teach you that your soul will burn in hell forever? when the scripture clearly says the soul that sins dies. The soul that sins, it dies. So it might have a hellish experience when it, uh, well the hellish experience that it has, brethren, is that it's buried alive with the bones of the body. If you can hear that. And I believe that people that have served Jesus as faithfully as possible, that there is a provision that they that there that there is a provision for them that they don't suffer after the body dies. I have to believe that. Until until that soul dies. It dies, it's trapped in the bones. So uh, you know, this kind of teaching would empty out the church. When Jesus said to the church, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, they all left him except for a few. The true teaching of Jesus Christ would empty out the church. So, when we read about the death of, of, of when we read about death, but when we read about the death of the first Adam, we read about the death of Christ. Okay. It's not talking about Jesus of Nazareth. The only church thinks it's talking about Jesus of Nazareth. I'm not talking about Jesus of Nazareth. I'm not talking about Jesus of Nazareth. I had the thought this morning about John the Revelator in the on Patmos. Just before the great revelation opened, and, and he saw it in the spirit, that whole revelation that, that became the book of Revelation. He saw it in the spirit. Just before he saw it in the spirit, he saw this man that was glorious, shiny and glorious. He, he didn't recognize him. He didn't think he was Jesus. He fell down on his knees in front of him. And that glorious, shining being said to him, don't do that. I'm a man just like you are. See? But it wasn't Jesus, per se. It was, it was ancient Adam, clothed in the personality of Jesus, but he was so different than the Jesus that John the Revelator knew that he didn't know who he was. Do you see what I just said? It was a spiritual being, ancient Adam, clothed in the personality of Jesus of Nazareth, or the material that formed the personality, because the, the nephesh greater soul is made of earth. So it was the nephesh greater soul of Jesus that, a, that enabled ancient Adam to appear to John the Revelator in a form. It was the soul of Jesus of Nazareth being integrated with that glorious being, which already Elijah was in there and Moses was in there. It was a collective soul. But it didn't look like Jesus of Nazareth because John didn't recognize it. So we're talking about Jesus is the name, because who can understand this? So Jesus is the name of this glorious one. But the glorified Jesus is different than Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth was absorbed into the glorious one. But the name of the glorious one is Jesus. But he's much more than Jesus of Nazareth. But who can understand this? 
So you can think it's Jesus of Nazareth until the day comes for the Lord to elevate your consciousness, which he's trying to do this morning. So Christ in the, in the scripture is not Jesus of Nazareth. Christ is either Christ and you. There's no distinction in these scriptures between Christ and you and, uh, and ancient Adam. It's, it's all the anointed one because Christ means the anointed one. The, the New Testament is a simplified version for people that do not have a strong background in the scripture. Simplified, see? Christ can mean any member of the household of God. You have to decide who he is by the surrounding words and the surrounding verses. You have to find out who Christ is in that context by reading the whole verse, if not the whole chapter. Just like the Hebrew letters that don't have vowels. And I've also told you that years ago when the Bible was written, there was no beginning or end of a sentence. It was just one letter after the other, the whole Bible, just one Hebrew letter after the other. You had to put in the vowels, you had to put in the beginning and the end of the sentence. That's what the New Testament is, with the word Christ. You have to read the whole sentence or the whole chapter to find out which aspect of the anointed one that scripture is talking about. And death, unless the scripture, and there are a couple of verses in Colossians chapter 2, that talks about the corporeal body. That's the material body. That's the word. Corporeal body. It's solid. If the scripture talks about the corporeal body, then it's talking about the corporeal body. If it doesn't say the corporeal body, if it doesn't say that body, that word body, then it's not talking about the corporeal body, it's talking about the soul. So you can't just read the scripture. I mean, you can't, you can just read it straight, and then you will be, and I'm not condemning anyone that's on this level, but you will be a simple person that reads the surface of the, of the word, and you have faith in a, in a concept, you have a concept in your mind, Jesus Christ, you know, and you probably think that he's God, and you know that he's capable of answering your prayers and having mercy on you, and that's how you live. But when your body dies, your soul will die with it. Your personality will die with it. And hopefully, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, your experience until that soul dies will not be tormenting. I don't really know that. I have to believe that God has mercy on people that have served him faithfully, with great faith to the level that they had it, who don't separate from their bones at, at death. Jesus is the only one that's separated from his bones that I know about. So there has to be some provision for mercy. So all of this really should have been given in, in uh, Colossians chapter 1, but it didn't, I, I didn't receive it in my spirit. Are there any questions or comments about what I told you? Okay, brethren, so um, if you're interested for yourself, Colossians chapter 1 is now annotated. You could, oh yes, I also wanted to talk to you about the whole Adam. That's footnote number one, actually. The whole Adam is the first and second Adam. That is Christ and the individual joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have a note here on page, uh, I have a note on page 4 to discuss the whole Adam. I really have to talk to you about the whole Adam because this is a correction. At one point, not too long ago, I was thinking that the Lord Jesus Christ, I was, I was con confusing the role of the function of the Lord Jesus Christ with the function of ancient Adam. I'm thinking, what's the difference between ancient Adam and Arik and Pain? The, the word Arik and Pain came, is in my consciousness because of something that, uh, uh, some, uh, something, a principle that came up in my study of Colossians chapter 2, which we will get to eventually. So I'm thinking to myself, why would, why would I be saying, or why would the scripture be saying a week in pain instead of ancient Adam? So here is the answer for you. Do you all know who a week in pain is? A week in pain is the, the part soup or the personality associated with the Keter. You know, the, the part soup of the third degree of power, which is Bina. The third degree of power is Bina, understanding, and her personality is mother. The attribute of the second degree of power 
his wisdom and his part suf his personality is the father. The part suf or the personality associated with the Keter is a regent pain. And actually, the Keter has two personalities, a regent pain and um, a regent pain and that's terrible. What? A regent pain. I, that's ridiculous that I can't remember that. I rebuke me in Jesus' name. Yomi? Atik Yomi, thank you. Atik Yomi and a regent pain. And Atik Yomi is the ancient, ancient of days. Atik Yomi is actually, the, the, whether the way, all of the worlds have to be connected. And the way that they're connected is that the Malkut of the high world sort of spreads, sort of like the, the cell production of a one cell organism, like a paramecium. You have a single cell organ, uh, um, organism and it breaks into two. Okay. The Malkut of the higher world, it doesn't separate, but it stretches itself out and becomes the seed of the lower world. See, the, the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ is attached to him. The seed that we receive comes from the Malkut of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's attached to him, if you can hear that. It's the, it's the Malkut of the Lord Jesus Christ descending into my body in the form of the seed called Christ. And Christ, in me, is building a whole new world which has ten spheres of its own or eventually will have ten spirit of its own. So, to me, a tik yomin is the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ, which then starts to divide itself and bring forth the ten full spirit of the world in me. And the keter of the ten full spirit in me is a reek and pe. So he is attached to, or emerges from, Atik Yomi, I'm going to tell you again. The Lord Jesus Christ sends forth the seed. The seed is still attached to him because the higher world that wants to build a lower world, okay, extends his, his Malkut. Malkut extends into the lower world and begins to form a whole new world. So the Lord Jesus Christ sent forth the seed. He's still attached to the seed. That is Atik Yomi in me is actually a part of the Keter of the higher world. And that Keter of the higher world then becomes the first seed of the new organism and extends itself into a regained pain which becomes the Keter of the ten spirit that will be within me. And the ten spirit that will be within me, and the ten spirit that will be within me, a regained pain, the Keter, is attached to a Tikyomin the tip of the Malkut of Jesus that sent the seed in the first place. Can you understand that? Mm -hmm. So, for all intents and purposes, it depends on how you look at it. A Tikyomin and a Rikyampin are two different aspects of the Keter in me. Okay, a Tikyomin and a Rikyampin are two, a two aspects or two faces of the Keter in me. One looks up to Jesus and one looks down to me or to the world that's being formed in me. There's a whole new world that's being formed in me, a whole new world is being formed in me. Okay. So, not too long ago, uh, I thought that it was the Lord Jesus Christ that was going to marry Christ in me. And, and that would be, you know, and, and that would be the marriage, that I thought that I would produce the man-child and the Lord Jesus Christ would marry me, and that would be the ultimate salvation. And then I found out that that wasn't true. Okay, this was just a few months ago. I found out that that wasn't true. That that it's and I was using the word ancient Adam. Okay, so that was that whole explanation to tell you what's the difference between a regain pain and ancient Adam. That's the difference. You know? Ancient Adam is in, is in a is in a higher world. Okay. We're talking about uh, we're talking about a weekend pain exists in every world. He is the beginning of the character of the of the new world. Okay. 
So ancient Adam is specifically in a higher world. He's in the world of Adam Kimon. And he probably never gets down here to us. You know? So, um, so a Reagan pain is much more accurate. I don't want to start confusing you at this point, but I started it, so let me finish it, because you have to hear this. A Reagan pain is more accurate than ancient Adam. This ancient Adam is so high above us, he can never be interacting with us. But that was my understanding at the time. The function, okay, if you can hear this, everything that I told you when I said it was ancient Adam, that I had the name wrong. Everything that I told you was correct, I had the name wrong, okay? So it's not ancient Adam coming down to marry the man child in us. He's in a very far away, exalted place that we could never at least in this state, never hope to even communicate with ancient Adam. Okay. He, he is the, 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 he is the extension of the light that entered into the empty space. Okay. Very, he's very, in a very high exalted place. So everything I told you about him, I should have been saying a re-campaign. Okay, meaning the Keter. Okay, either a Rikimin or a Tikyomin. Okay, the one that's going to be marrying us is a regain pain. The one that's going to be marrying the mantra is a regain pain. They're talking about the, the unification, brethren, the separate, the, the divide, the fall. The fall put a separation between the upper triad and the and the separate below. There's this big empty space. Christ in us is the seven separate below. The upper triad is up here. Eternal life is up here. The lower triad, the Christ in you, has to be connected to life, which is up here, the upper triad. Okay. The upper triad up here, a weak in pain, chokma and bina. Okay. They are all attached to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is attached to the God world of absolute. We're down here. There's this big empty space. So who is coming to marry the child in us that's going to attach us? to the upper triad of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. It's actually, oh God, I don't need to explain this. It's, it, it, it is, remember, it is, it is a reek and pain, the keter of the upper triad in us mm -hmm. that's going to marry the lower triad in us. Okay. Jesus sent a seed, okay. Jesus sent a seed that's attached to him that's attached to the world above. And that seed that Jesus sent, okay, it's, 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 developed, it's developed into the lowest, it's developed into something within us that is capable of being joined to by the upper triad. Oh, God, I hope I should explain this. I'm going to try again. The Lord Jesus Christ is ascended. He's attached to eternity. He's attached to the God world of absolute. There's nothing in the average in the average human that, for the Lord Jesus Christ to reach down and pull our soul out of this body and save our soul. There's nothing in us that he can lay hold of because everything is sin. So his seed in us is a holy seed that when it develops in us will be something that the Lord Jesus can grab hold of. And when he, when he grabs hold of that seed which is developing into the child, when he lays hold of it, to rip the child out of us, our soul will go with him. We'll separate from the bones of the body and go with him. That's the plan. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question is, what, what is coming down? Who is coming down to marry the man-child in us? Who is coming down to marry the man-child in us? And I thought it was the Lord Jesus Christ coming down to marry the man child. Mm -hmm. And then I, I said, you know, I found out that that's wrong. It can't be the Lord Jesus Christ coming down to marry the man child in us because the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the second Adam, joined to Christ in us, makes the whole Adam. The whole Adam is Christ Jesus in heaven and earth together is the whole Adam. Christ Jesus in heaven and earth is the whole Adam. So 
Jesus is not coming down to marry Christ in us. Okay? Brethren, I'm really sorry. Let me try this again. There is one process that Jesus is going to, is going to, is going to, how, how, why do I have this all confused? Jesus is coming down to join with Christ in us, and that will make us the whole Adam. Okay, the whole Adam. Is that the mantra? I'm, st I'm stuttering right now because I don't know if that's the mantra. My whole point is, I think I just lost it. That what am I going to leave you with? I just see all these questions in my mind. What am I going to leave you with here? What I told you, trying to bring a correction here, right? the last thing that I told you was that the whole Adam is the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ in me and ancient Adam together. I told you that was the whole Adam. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I have to back off on that. There was a mistake, it was an overcorrection, because I realized that it couldn't be the Lord Jesus marrying the man-child in me, because Jesus is a part of the man-child. I, I, I realized that Jesus, it could not be Jesus marrying in Christ in me. Uh, I could, uh, it couldn't be Jesus marrying the man-child in me, because it takes the whole Adam to produce the man-child. It couldn't be Jesus marrying the man-child in me because it takes Jesus above and it takes the whole Adam, Jesus above and Jesus below, to produce the man-child. That ancient Adam is going to come and marry. Mm -hmm. So, since I messed this whole thing up and now I have to review it with the Lord, let me just leave it with you with that. That the whole Adam is the Lord Jesus above who is the second Adam, and Christ below. That is the whole Adam. He exists in heaven, and he exists in earth. And where I'm stuck right now is I'm not exactly sure where the man-child is in all this. You know? Is the whole Adam the man-child? But the issue is that... The issue... Okay, this is, let me leave it like this, because I'm really messing this up badly. The whole Adam is Jesus above and Christ below. That's the whole Adam. The last thing I told you was it included, that the whole Adam included ancient Adam, and that is wrong. The whole Adam is the Lord Jesus above and, and Christ, attached to Christ. His feet are in the earth. The whole Adam. His head is in heaven, and his feet are in our earth. That's the whole Adam. And I'm going to stop here. I'm going to tell you what my problem is. Okay, at this point, from that perspective, I'm not sure where the man-child is. Is that, is the whole Adam the man-child himself? Or does the whole Adam first produce the man-child? So that's where I'm stuck right now, okay? So I want to leave it at that, that I brought the correction, that the whole Adam is the head in heaven and the feet in the earth. The whole Adam does not include ancient Adam. That's the correction that I brought. Now I have to see if I can hear from God as to, I thought that I had it when I came out here, is exactly... Uh, where the man-child is and exactly who is joining with the man-child. So I have to reevaluate that whole thing. So I hope that I left you with something that you can lay hold of there. The whole Adam is Jesus, the head in heaven, and his feet, Christ in, our, in, in the earth, or his feet. And exactly where the man-child comes into that, I'm going to have to get back to you on because if I, if I had it, I lost it. So is there, can anybody have anything to say to me before we go on? Sorry, I'm sorry about that confusion. I will clear it up for you as soon as I can. Okay. So, but that's that's my main point because the, the, the scriptures they're talking about the whole Adam all the time. So you need to understand that the whole Adam does not include ancient Adam. It includes Jesus, uh, the glorified Jesus in heaven, and Christ are His feet in the earth. Okay. Okay. Moving on now to Colossians chapter two. Alternate. Oh no, this is the King James version. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them that Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, 
in whom I have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should regard you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. That no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men? which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Okay, now, this chapter started off with a bang, okay, because verse one, the, the, Paul is saying this absolutely great message to people and was completely missed by the King James translators. For I would that ye knew what conflict I have for you. Well, the Hebrew word conflict, uh, the Greek word conflict, rather, in Strong's 73. The first definition of the word is a place of assembly. So the King James translators didn't know what to do with that, so they took the second definition, but the correct definition is a place of assembly. So I know that I've talked to you about this before, but it's been a long time, so let's review it. The place of the, Israel is called the community of Israel, of the assembly of Israel. It's all through the scripture. So I have, I took this off of the internet for you. You have some exhibits giving you uh, some information about the greater assembly, which is the, the, uh, of the, the, um, the ruling body of the Jews. Okay, I'm not printing it out, it was just for your information. The greater assembly, the Sanhedrin is the greater assembly, the gathering together of the rulers of Israel. That term of assembly is so prominent in Jewish literature, and the King James translators just missed what Paul was saying. So let's just take a minute to read, to give you some information about this, how important this concept of community or the assembly of the Israelites is to Jewish life. And I took this information off of the internet. You have the, uh, you, the URL there of the whole article. Seems to be a very good site. It is a Christian site. They talk about the New, you know, the New, New Testament also. 
Okay, so this is, I pick up in the middle, a, a community set apart. The, the Hebrew word ida means a gathering of people. The King James translation always translates this word as community, while the NIV will translate it as community or assembly. When ida is used of Israel, it always refers to all the descendants of Jacob, the entire nation of Israel. And the following verses are examples of how the word ida is used. The whole Israelite community, this is Exodus 16.1. The whole Israelite community set out from Elin and came to the desert of Sin. Exodus 35.1. Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. Numbers 26, 2. Take a census of the whole Israelite community by families. Since God has set the entire nation of Israel apart from all other nations, we can say that the community, Ida, of Israel, are those whom God has set apart. The next topic underneath on this website is the Holy Assembly. Another Hebrew word used for gathering the, the, the people is kahal. Again, the King James Version is consistent in translating this word as assembly, but the NIV may translate it as assembly or community. The assembly of Israel are those within the community, within the Eda, who have consecrated themselves by keeping God's decrees and are therefore made holy by God. Here are a few verses using the word kahal, Leviticus 4.14. When they become aware of the sin they committed, the assembly must bring a young bull as a sin offering and present it before the tent of meeting. Psalms 89.5. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. The difference between the assembly and the community is based on an individual's relationship with God. All the people within the community have been set apart by God. They were all delivered out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and were given God's decrees. But there were some within the community who rejected God and His covenant. Those who remain faithful to God and His covenant are a part of the assembly of Israel. Those who are in the assembly of Israel are also a part of the community of Israel, but not everyone in the community of Israel is part of the assembly of Israel. Although the whole community is set apart by God, only those who keep God's covenant are part of the assembly and are made holy. This then is the holy assembly. Although the whole community is set apart by God. Only those who keep God's covenant are part of the assembly and are made holy. And this then is the holy assembly. That this one should not be green. And this is, that was all for the website. This is now my comment. The Kabbalah, in Kabbalah, the Kabbalah Unveiled by McGregor Matthews, that's a book, okay? I have it here. I don't recommend that you read it because it's Christian Kabbalah, but it seems to be a very prominent book in the field of Christian Kabbalah. The Kabbalah Unveiled by McGregor Matthews talks about the greater and the lesser assembly. He's actually speaking about Arik and Pin, the greater assembly the long face, or the infinitely patient one. That's the Keter. And the Aaron being the lesser assembly, the impatient one. In other words, the father and the son. We would know this as the father and the son. So he's talking about Arik and Pin, the greater assembly, and the Aaron Pin. So Arik and Pin apparently includes Chokma and Bina. So the divide is between the father and the son. It was the son who died. The father still exists in the form of Keter, Chokma, and Bina, known as Erik and Pin. And the son is being risen from the dead, is being raised from the dead in, in the womb of you and me. The son, it was the son of God that died, so Erik and Pin died. And it's Erik and Pin, the upper triad, that's raising him from the dead in you and me.
there is another name for them which also appears in the Zohar, and that is, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly or not, the macroprosopus and the microprosopus. And I know that I've, I've spoken to you about this before over the years. I say macroprosopus and microprosopus because if there is a micro, there should be a macro. But the word macroprosopus is not found in the Zohar. It is, however, found in the Kabbalah unveiled by McGregor Matthews, an apparently well-accepted book on Kabbalah and from the non-Jewish community. I may not have made it clear here, but the, the Zohar talks about a recampaign. They do not call him the macroprosopus. They call him a recampaign. Anyway, I have a quote from the Zohar for you, which does use the word microprosopus. We have learned that when the priests hold their hands outspread in blessing, the congregation should be in fear and awe and realize that it is time of favor in all the worlds, when the upper and lower worlds are being blessed, and there is everywhere an absence of rigor, that means harsh judgment. It is a moment when the undisclosed aspect of the ancient of ancients, which is actually a tikkun, I mean, the ancient of ancients is being revealed as microposophus, and thus peace prevails then everywhere. So uh, the information that I gave you above was, was pretty much from what I found on the internet that Kabbalah unveiled is speaking about a regain pain, but apparently the macroposophus, and they don't, the Zohar doesn't even use that word, but they're talking about the atik, not a week. And I, I, spent, I spent about five minutes explaining the difference between atik and a week. And the difference is that a week, you know, mean, is a part of the lower world, and atik, you mean, is a part of the highest world. So I will ask the Lord to help me to review that and get a better explanation for you in the future, because I'm not satisfied with what I said here, and I apologize for the confusion. So we, we see that the, the issue is between the Ancient of Days and the Sun. It's, be, it's between the Ancient One, so I guess it is Ancient Adam, whose sons died in it before time began, and we've had that whole teaching recently, how the stream of light entered into the empty space, and that is the Ancient One, and the first aspect of the creation was to create these six, which was literally the Sun, and the six, which is the Sun, joined to the Ancient One, is Ancient Adam. Remember that teaching only a few months ago? And then it was the six that got into trouble, and, and they, it was, so that, so Ancient Adam, as I just tried to explain to you in the most imperfect way, to initiate the building of the worlds below, started to descend into the lower world. So you now, in the in the teachings that I gave you recently that came out of the Zohar about these these six that were created to be joined to the ancient one, there was no talk about. See, that only is nine. You know, the, that six and the three from the upper tribe. What happened to the tenth? I was assuming that the stream of light was the upper three, and then the six. It has to be a seventh. It has to be a seventh, because the, the group below the upper triad are seven. The seventh one is Malku. So I didn't understand why the teaching in the Zohar wasn't talking about the seventh wasn't including Malku. Well, they weren't including the female. So there were these six sons that sent that that brought forth out of themselves that female, and it was, it's actually the Malkut that descends into the lower world. So, I, and this is really deep, I hope I'm not ruining this for you, I hope you can understand this. So here, we have, we have, of course this is just a parable, we have the ancient one, she's the silver of the pen, and then she brought forth these six, okay, so that, now she has an, an entity called ancient Adam, okay, from the silver, okay, down to the let's say all the way down to the bottom of the black, okay? That's now ancient Adam. And now the job, their job is to, is to bring into existence lower and, 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 and a collectively more visible worlds. So this ancient Adam brought forth a female, the tip of the pen brought forth a female. 
and it was the female that descended into the undeveloped substance of the lower world. The female developed into the undeveloped substance of the lower world. And it was actually, this is probably Sophia, this tip right here, is probably Sophia. And it was this Malku that was receiving worship, that all the beings in the lower world, because, because there was a material substance that was made, that was a conscious material substance, some form of humanity. The, the material substance was there, that this, this Malku entered into a lower, lower world where there already existed a material, a conscious material substance. God being as great as he is, they were probably beings like us. Think in terms of beings like us to help you understand what I'm saying. And this was like God coming down to these beings that were below. And they were worshipping the tip of the pen, which is Malkut only, as God. And giving no glory to the six or to the ancient one who was really the, the progenitor of the whole creation. So this Malkut is the only part that's visible to the lower world. And it's the job of this Malku to tell the people, and we see that in Paul, when one of the cities that he visited, they wanted to sacrifice to him. They thought that he came down from another planet and they wanted to sacrifice to him. He said, please don't do that. He said, I'm not a god. I come to tell you about the invisible god that you are so, so are seeking. So that was the job of Malku, to tell the people, don't worship me. And that was what that was what the, the being in the, in the garden, whatever his correct name is, said to John, don't worship me, I'm a man just like you are. Worship God. And that's what is my job, and that's what is your job. When God starts doing miracles here, brethren, you better get your act together and make sure that anyone trying to give you glory, that you redirect them to the one who gave you the power. And don't take it for yourself, because you won't last very long. You're way behind. You have a lot of catching up to do. Okay. So this Malku, from the original ancient Adam, for lack of a better way to express it, was not telling the lower beings below, no, I'm not a god. Worship God up here that you can't see. No, she was taking the, the worship. This is Sophia. She was accepting the worship. And the result was that the ancient one up here said, ah, uh -uh. I'm not going to tolerate that, okay? And separated the Malkut from the six, and maybe the six were corrupted also because the break happened over here. The six might have gone along with it, I don't know exactly what happened, but everything fell down. Only the ancient one remained because the ancient one is the root, see? And that's, that, that was the fall. That was the initial fall, and we've been falling ever since. Falling from world to world, doing it, experiencing that fall over and over and over and over again. We're still, we're still tumbling. The creation is still tumbling. But we're just about hitting bottom. We're just about hitting bottom because this is the end of the ages. And the Ancient One has sent forth, actually himself, you know, clothed in the name Jesus, the glorified Jesus, to rescue that which was lost. His spirit, his son, was lost. The female, uh, the, the Shekinah in captivity was lost. And the, and the material substance was lost. He's coming to get that which was lost. We belong to him. And we've been purchased back by the glorification of Jesus Christ. There's no longer any excuse. The Lord Jesus Christ has overcome Sophia Okay, and now it's just a matter of the victory being uh, expanded to, to all of the human beings on the face of the earth. The rest is easy. Now, why is it easy? Because Jesus has the authority. A human being, born of a man and a woman, if you could just understand this, brother, you'd stop fighting with me to tell me that Jesus was God. A human being, born of a man and a woman, overcame death. What good does it do you that Jesus was God? What good does it do you to believe that Jesus is God? That will not stop you from dying. Jesus, a man born of a man and a woman, overcame death. And God has enabled him by the power of God to share his victory with us in the form of a seed that will enable us to have the same experience. 
That's the message. Not that he's God. See? So, why did I even start to tell you that? Why was I even talking about that? What was I even talking about that? I started telling you that. So, um, so anyway, that, that is the, that, this is what Paul was talking about. He wasn't saying that I have a great affliction for you. He was saying, Paul came, Paul came as a messenger to tell the Colossians about his wonderful, incredible, unbelievable experience and to tell them that God wanted, to, wanted him to share it with them so that they could have it too. Paul said, I've come to tell you about the great assembly that's inside of me. The assemblage of the world above and the world below. The reconnection of the Father and the Son. The Son was separated from the Father. Paul said, I've come to tell you about this wonderful, great experience that I'm having. That the Father and the Son are reconciled within me. And they've commissioned me to give you this message to reveal the mystery of the ages so that you too will become eligible for the same experience. It's the will of God that you should have the same experience. That's what he was saying to them. Not that he was afflicted for them. That's a big, 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 big difference, brethren. Big, 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 big difference. So, I have another comment for you at the top of page 8. Paul is telling the Colossians that the unified Father and the Son dwell in the, midst, in the midst of him, and that he desires that they should know how the Father and the Son, they should know about the Father and the Son, so that they might have the same experience. Well, in the translation, verse 1. It is my desire for you, Paul speaking, it is my desire for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that includes you and me, to know about the great assembly that I am possessed of. To have is another translation of the word have is possess. I want you to know about the great assembly that I am possessed of, even the Father and the Son. That's why I'm here. To tell you that it's my desire that you should have this same experience. So I would like to do what I did with chapter 1. I would like to go through the alternate translation. It's just that I think the first two verses were very complicated. All the others are not this complicated. So we'll do verse 2 this way also. Um, King James, verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Well, that sounds really nice, but what is, do you have any idea what that means? It's, it's this message that I preach in code. So, the another, an old translation of the word translated comfort is invited. Being it, meaning united, that's easy. Riches, meaning abundance, that's easy. Acknowledgement, we're translating recognition, that's no big deal. All of this is, uh, all of the rest of this is easy. But I have a comment here. Paul is saying that they are invited to be united with the Lord Jesus Christ so that they can be a part of the whole Adam. But in order to do that, they must, re but in addition to that, they must, or for that to happen, not in addition, for that to happen, they must recognize that he is a father to them as well as the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the father of Christ, that is being planted in the midst of them to accomplish that union. Now this is very interesting. First of all, 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. But in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So we know, I've been telling you for a long time, that there is a reality that anyone that has seed, I have seed. I am your father in the Lord. I am the father of Christ in you. No, I'm, not. I'm the father of you. The Lord Jesus Christ the, the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Father of Christ in you. But I'm also a father because I have begotten you. It's through my word and my teaching that Christ is growing in you and you're having this experience. So I find that sort of interesting and it's sort of parallel to Jesus' ex experience. God is the Father of Christ within Jesus. 
but Joseph was the father of the physical body. So I'm a physical father to you, okay, raising you up in a similar manner to the way your father raised you up when you were a child. I'm teaching you about your sins. I'm teaching you right from wrong in the spiritual world. I'm teaching you how to function in the spiritual world. I'm teaching you how to, how to function in the body of Christ and in the kingdom of God. So I'm, I am a, a father to you in a parallel experience to your natural father. I'm training up the natural man to function in the spiritual life. So God is the father of Christ in you. I'm not the father of Christ, but I am your father in that I'm teaching you how to grow up into and live a whole new lifestyle. And Paul made that very clear. And that was a major issue in this ministry that was not happening that the Lord began to correct three and a half years ago in Texas. And then unfortunately I had to ask someone to leave the ministry over because she absolutely refused to give me that respect that Paul is demanding in Colossians 2. He's absolutely demanding it. He's saying you cannot have this experience if you do not recognize that I am your father in this, in this manner that I just described. You have two fathers, father of the spirit and the father of the flesh. So the alternate translation in verse 2 is that all of you might be invited to have your hearts united together with the agape love of the Son of God so that you might experience his spiritual abundance. You might, that, that all of you might be invited. He says, I'm, I want you to know about the Father and the Son, that all of you might be invited to have your hearts united together with the agape love of the Son of God so that you might experience his spiritual abundance and be entirely confident that you understand the mystery of God and can recognize the Father, that you can recognize this Father and the Father of Christ. And that word, this, is, is there. I actually had to go back after I translated this because it wasn't clear to me. But if you, if you need that explanation, you can see above which word is translated this. The word the is translated this. The word of actually meant father. Because the word father does appear twice in the interlinear text, although it's not translated twice. The word, it's, that's in the paragraph right under the King James Version. You can see that the word father um, is a correct translation of the English word of. And the word this is a correct translation of the English word the. So there were... What did I do there? The mystery of God and the father of the... I have the father there twice. That's a mistake in my notes. The word father appears in the interlinear text twice, but it's only translated once. And the word this is not translated. So this is the correct translation. You can have this if you understand the mystery of God that you should be confident that you understand the mystery of God and can recognize this Father and the Father of Christ. Because if you don't recognize me as a father or a leader, you won't learn from me. And there's more that you have to learn. There. Christ is not going to teach you what I teach you. I've told you many times, if you don't understand or you have a problem, go home and talk to the Lord at home. Talk to your husband, talk to the Christ in the midst of you at home and ask for a witness. But for all of you, although we seem to be in very good shape right now, but there was, over the years there's always been somebody that did not want to learn from me. They were determined that God would teach them what Christ within them would teach them uh, themselves. They wanted to keep that, that, that uh, unique relationship. Of course, you can keep your unique, your unique relationship with the Holy Spirit, but he's not going to give you what he does not have to give you. I'm the one, a human teacher, is what God has given you to teach your humanity how to function in the spiritual life. And you cannot deny me and say that your unique relationship with the Holy Spirit will teach you everything that you need. Based on a scripture in the Old Testament that says, in that day, everyone, everyone will be taught of God. And that hasn't happened to you yet. See? So, that was verse 2. Is my desire for you and for them in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, 
to know about the great assembly that I am possessed of, even the Father and the Son, that all of you might be invited to have your hearts united together with the agape love of the Son of God, so that you might experience his spiritual abundance and be entirely confident that you can understand the mystery of God. I guess it should be if you recognize this Father and the Father of Christ. I do want to really pray about that. It looks like that should be conditional. That you might be entirely confident that you understand the mystery of God if you can recognize the Father and the Father of Christ. You will understand the mystery of God if you can recognize this Father and the Father of Christ. So that has to be a conditional. I have to rewrite that. That you might experience his spiritual abundance, that's his desire for you, and be entirely confident. Huh, I have to rewrite this whole verse. That you might experience this his spiritual abundance and be entirely confident, I guess it would be, in, in receiving eternal life. In receiving eternal life. If you understand, or when you understand the mystery of God and recognize this Father as well as the Father of Christ. Those are the terms, those are the conditions. If you recognize this Father and the Father of Jesus Christ, okay, then you have that then you are invited to have your hearts united and tied together with the Son of God and experience his abundance and, and receive the confidence that you will have this experience. That the that this experience that I'm telling you about will manifest in your life. It will manifest in your life. It is my will that it will manifest in your life. And it will manifest in your life if you can recognize this Father as well as the Father of Jesus Christ. So I have to rewrite this whole verse. Any question on that? Okay, but now from here on in, I'm going to go directly to the alternate translation. Because really, it's really pretty easy. Starting with verse 3. In whom are all the secrets of wealth, and this is Christ, Christ in you. In whom are all the secrets of wealth, which came from, which come from wisdom and knowledge. So being told here that if you want wealth in this world, it arises wealth without sorrow. Yeah. There are some very wealthy people that have a great sorrow in their life. They lose children, they're sick, they have all kinds of bad experiences. Am I the only one that's warm in here? I hope the, I had it on 74. I hope it didn't go back up. Please, do see what you can do with it. I hope it's not broken. So wealth without sorrow arises out of wisdom and knowledge. And knowledge comes before wisdom. It's always backwards in the scripture. A knowledge of God. A knowledge of God results in wisdom. And if you live for God out of that knowledge and wisdom, wealth will find you. What was it? It was a uh, 74, but the inside was 75, so I think it's clicking on. Did it get very hot outside? It was freezing last night. Uh, I know. No, okay. but it's, okay. yeah, I agree. It's cold. got a little warm in here. What did you say? It was cold this night. It was cold this night. Maybe it's just the fire of God in here. I'm sweating. Okay. okay. Uh, verse 4. So I say this to you so that no one should deceive you with persuasive language. Okay. I want you to have it. These are the conditions. You have to understand that Jesus is the Father of Christ in you. You have to understand that you need a Father in the earth to teach you because Christ in you is not going to teach you everything. And that scripture that says no man need teach you does not apply to this stage of your life. You need to understand that. You need to understand that the, that wealth, first of all, wealth is spiritual. That when you are spiritually wealthy, it will produce material wealth in this world. And the, and the spiritual wealth comes from a knowledge of God and what he requires of you. And the wisdom that arises out of God. And you live that life. And eventually, it materializes in this world as wealth. And I say this to you, that no one should deceive you with persuasive language. There's no shortcut. 
There's no shortcut. I'm telling you what's required of you to understand the mysteries and to have wealth in this world. And anything else that anyone's telling you is, uh, is persuasive language that's intended to deceive you. There's no shortcut, brethren. When your heart is to serve God, to love God, and when your heart, your primary heart is to, is to develop his kingdom, everything will be added unto you. You have to come out of your selfishness, brethren. You have to come out of your selfishness. Verse 5. Because even though I am absent in the flesh, I am nevertheless with you, rejoicing in the spirit at the sight of your orderly lifestyle and the stability that you, and the stability of your faith in Christ. Miss, excuse me, miss. There is no separation from an orderly lifestyle and a stable faith in Jesus Christ. You have to be in order. Everything that you want to accomplish, you should say to what? How do I accomplish this? How, how, will you make a way for me to give my teaching? How do I accomplish this? There's no separating an orderly lifestyle, okay, and the stability of your faith in Christ. You cannot separate them. Verse 6. Therefore, since you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, you should live according to a lifestyle built upon his root in you. So we see that Christ in us is the root, the beginning of a, of a spiritual kingdom. And the, and the, the scripture, well, certainly the esoteric doctrine, says that every one of us is a world, is a spiritual world. Every one of us is a spiritual world in our, ourselves. And the root of that world is Christ in you. It's a whole new kingdom being built in the midst of the kingdom of darkness. Because right now, brethren, everyone born of a woman has an inner man. And that inner man is a kingdom. And it's the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of darkness dwells in us. So the seed of Christ is a whole new kingdom. It's the seed of a whole new kingdom. So surely the principalities of the kingdom of darkness within us, which we know is our carnal mind, which we simplify by calling them Satan and Leviathan, are going to try to kill that seed. And if they cannot kill that seed, they will try to kill us. But if we are truly clinging to the Lord Jesus Christ, truly clinging to him, for his whole life, for his kingdom, not just for a particular benefit that we want in our life, not just because of something that we want, but we are clinging to him because for the, what's going to make you cling to him is what I'm teaching you, if you can understand this, that all of the abundance and the power, everything that you desire to have in your life, okay, there are no shortcuts. It starts with the knowledge of what God requires of you the wisdom, okay, and understanding of it will ultimately produce everything in your life that you desire. You cannot take the kingdom by violence. You cannot take it by force. You cannot jump over proper motives, godly motives, or proper channels to go through to accomplish your goal. And not knowing what those channels are is unacceptable to God because you have me. It's absolutely no reason for you in this ministry to not know the proper way of accomplishing what you would desire, as long as it's a legitimate desire in the ministry. You have me, and there's probably people here right now that other people in the ministry could, that could tell you you don't even have to come to me. There are other elders in the ministry right now that could tell you what channels you follow, how you go about accomplishing what you want to accomplish in the ministry. There are ways to do things, and you cannot take the, that what you desire by force, you see. The violent take it by force. That means you're a violent person. In that instance, what does that mean? It means the violence within you, which is the kingdom of darkness within you. That was your carnal mind that tried to control the, the right order that is in Christ in this ministry. So you have to lay down the violence of your carnal mind, and find out how to do it in Christ. And you need to understand and admit that your whole life you've been a violent person, although you, no one would ever think you were a violent person, you never killed anybody, but your mind was violent. You know? 
that you didn't communicate with people properly and find out how to do it properly. What is properly? A way that is not sin. That's what properly is. How to accomplish something without violating another person. I, brother, I had to learn that. I'm teaching you because I had to learn. I didn't learn that when I was growing up. I didn't know how to accomplish what I wanted without sinning. The Lord taught me, and now I can teach you. But you have to be willing to learn. So therefore, since you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, you should live according to a lifestyle built upon this, built upon his root in you, and established upon the faith that you have been taught. And you should need to be overflowing with thanksgiving. Built upon his root in you and established upon the faith that you have been taught, overflowing and overflowing with thanksgiving. Now here's a warning from Paul. Watch out. Watch out. Be careful that no one seduces you through philosophy or through unfounded delusions about the future that you can learn from the traditions of the first Adam who was cast down into your orderly arrangement, into the orderly arrangement of this world, and not after Christ. I just want to see if I have any comments here. What is the next verse that I have a comment on? Verse 8 is the next verse that I have a comment on. Okay, now, this is an interesting verse because the whole church thinks that Paul is saying that you should not be involved in philosophy. But Paul never told us not to be involved in philosophy. He says, watch out that no one seduces you through philosophy. So, well, what does that mean? It means that you need to know the true philosophy. Philosophy, to not be seduced by philosophy means you have to not be ignorant. Okay? So it reminds me of, of a problem that I had here years ago. A woman came here and she said the Lord told her she had to have this message. And she didn't want to... For, she, did, she didn't want to stay in the ministry for some, whatever her reason was, and she was demanding that I give her free cassette tapes when she left the ministry in an ungodly manner, and I wouldn't do it. And she was enraged at me, called me up saying, don't you understand? Don't you understand, Sheila? The Lord told me I need to have this message, and you therefore have to give me what I want. No, she had to come into the ministry and submit to me to, to obey God. So she was disobedient to God by leaving this ministry. And, I, and there have been a lot of people that have left here. I haven't said this about anyone else. But I'm telling you the truth. She said, God told me I need that message, and therefore you have to give me those tapes. She didn't even understand that the tapes alone wouldn't have helped her. If you want what I have, you have to come and follow my rules. See? May my rules always be God's rules. So there's big understanding in people's mind. This is the mind of the flesh. Your mind is confused. Paul never said, don't, don't study philosophy. Don't learn the true philosophy, which is the wisdom of God. So that, he says, don't be seduced by philosophy. How are you not seduced by philosophy? That is actually Paul saying, study philosophy. Study the true philosophy of God so that you're not seduced by false philosophy. Philosophy is just another word for wisdom. Study the true wisdom so that you're not seduced by the false wisdom. But the church says, oh no, no philosophy. We'll just stay ignorant. Now that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Makes no sense at all. Makes no sense at all, brother. So Paul is saying, watch out that no one seduces you. He doesn't say watch out for philosophy. He says watch out that no one seduces you because they have wisdom and you are ignorant. The scripture says, put on the full armor of God. And then stand well, the full armor of God includes wisdom. How do you defend your mind? It says, put on the helmet of, uh, I think the helmet of salvation goes around, it goes around your mind. How do you defend your mind? By knowing the truth. When you know the truth, you'll recognize the error every time. The seducible ones are the uneducated ones that are out there screaming and yelling. And, you know, I, I, I asked a couple of people recently because I've, I've noticed in the church <laughs> that at least the local church, the services that I've gone to recently, that these evangelists that they're bringing in, they, they want the people to scream and yell 
and through the whole hour or two and the turns jump up and sit down and jump up and sit down and scream and yell and uh, one of the brethren here told me yeah that seems to be what they're doing it's all over the internet jump up and scream and yell and holler so the Lord told told me where they're getting this from I read it I believe it was in first Samuel I recently read in my daily devotions that the Israelites were losing the battle against um, the Philistines they were being they were defeated by the Philistines so they said well what is the solution? Let's go get the Ark of God. It never occurred to them to say, Lord, what sin are we in that we're losing the battle? Okay. They said, oh, let's go get the Ark of God. Let's go get a big cross and stand it up over here. Maybe, maybe, maybe the anointing will come down, okay? If we get a big cross and stick it in the middle of the church or something like that. Let's go get the Ark of God because we were just defeated by the Philistines. So we're the Israelites. How can we be defeated by the Philistines? Sin never entered their mind. Let's go get the Ark of God. And when the Ark of God came into the camp, all the men screamed, they screamed, and they yelled, and they shouted when the Ark of God came into the camp. And then what happened? They were defeated by the Philistines again. So their shouting was in vain. The Lord told me that's what these evangelists and pastors are trying to get their people to do, because there's no anointing in the church. So they think if they can get them to scream and yell, maybe the anointing will come down. So first of all, they screamed and yelled when the Ark of God came into the camp. Not, they didn't scream and yell to get it to come into the camp. So that's an error right there. And second of all, the screaming and yelling and the bringing of the Ark did them no good. Because, why? Why did it do them no good? Why did it do them no good? I just told you. Why did it do you no good? Anybody on the phone, the computer, anywhere. Why did it do you no good? I just told you twice. They were defeated twice. Without the ark, without the screaming and yelling, and with the ark and with the screaming and yelling, the Philistines defeated them. And the second time, they captured the ark of God. Why? Why were the Israelites defeated? Because they didn't confess their sin or think of sin. Or no sin. They weren't dealing with their sins. You want to bring down the anointing? Confess your sins. You're a pastor. There's no anointing in your church. Teach your people to confess their sins, and the anointing will come down. Is it a big mystery? I don't know. It's right there in the book. I don't get it. Do you get it? I don't get it. It's called self-delusion. It's called self-delusion, brethren. Pastors, you want the anointing to come down in your church? Teach about sin and righteousness. And stop with the miracles already.